Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Peak Human. We're doing things a little differently. I'm going to just do a quick intro just about the guests, just about what we talk about, and then we'll move on to the show. Today, my podcast is with Dr. Ted Naiman and Dr. Nick Norwitz. We're doing a little friendly debate. They're both great, both on the same page a lot, but it's really fun to get differing opinions on things. I think I'm going to do more of these friendly debate episodes. I want to get some vegans on. I want to get people of all sides letting them give their perspective, talking it through. I can be sort of in the middle, putting in my two cents, trying to be unbiased, trying to let each side talk. I think it's really fun, and I don't think a lot of people are doing it, and I think this would be fun to do more often. So let me know what you think about it. I'll tell you a little bit more about Dr. Ted Naiman. People should know by now. He's been on my show many times. He wrote the book, The P to E Diet. He has a lot of the same philosophies that I do about these high-level views of health, why things are the way they are in the last, say, 100 years. He's seen about 100,000 patients or more in his career as a family medicine doctor, He and he's learned a lot from that, and I really respect his opinion, and I love all his work and his memes and his diagrams and the way he makes things simple to understand. And we also have Nick Norwitz, who is a PhD and getting his MD. He's got a PhD from Oxford getting his MD now at Harvard, fancy, fancy schools. He's great. He's on Twitter a lot. He's actually helping me maybe publish a paper. He's doing a lot of cool stuff and has a little differing opinion. And he has been going back and forth with Dr. Ted Naiman and some other people about some of these concepts that we speak on today. Namely, satiety per calorie is a big topic, which maybe sounds super boring and weird to people, but this covers all of nutrition topics. It covers so much, even though we are talking a lot about the satiety per calorie concept, you will get a lot from this episode, really interesting stuff. We talk about tons of nutrition concepts and food and health and why people get fat, why people are sick, so many things. So I hope you enjoy this one. Let me know if you want to hear more of these debate style podcasts. And thanks for listening, everyone. All right, guys, we did it. We got two busy guys together. Me, I'll, I'll count myself as less busy, even though, I don't know. We, we don't need to have a busyness war here. <laughs> but it's great to get everyone together. Uh, I want everyone to introduce themselves. And then I also want to do a couple more things. Uh, I want to talk about just what you guys did in the last 24 hours. I think that kind of just will paint a picture of our lives because I have some interesting stuff that happened to me in the last 24 hours, which I'd like to share. But, you know, I know Nick, I was texting with Nick and, you know, he was up late, you know, doing whatever he was doing. So let's start off with who you are and uh, what you do and just anything about yourself that's relevant and kind of just paint us a little picture of, I don't know, the last day. Just, I think that just would help the audience get some context here because I'm barely setting up what the context of this discussion is. We're going to talk a lot about uh, nutrition nerdy stuff that hopefully people are really interested in. There's been some Twitter back and forth between all three of us, some other players like Dr. Andreas Einfeld, who's with dietdoctor.com. Maybe Amber O'Hearn is involved. Uh, we'll just jump right in though. I'll, I'll let Nick go first. Sure. Uh, my name is Nick Norwitz. I'm uh, currently a medical student in my clerkship here at, um, at Harvard Med and, and Massachusetts General Hospital. Before medical school, I did my PhD at Oxford in human metabolism and neurodegenerative diseases. Um, last 24 hours, I've really been just catching up on some paper writing I have to do. I have like six papers I'm writing, and Friday the day before was our um, neuro boards exam. So we were just finishing up the neuro block, and then I have feeds next. So we're just catching up on, on uh, a lot of writing mostly and uh, doing some grocery shopping and more writing. So um, I've been kind of procrastinating that until this weekend. Cool. And what, what kind of papers are you working on, like broadly? Um, we have a meta-analysis, um, one controlled trial, um, some of my PhD work from Oxford, and then a couple papers actually on chat GPT, um, interestingly enough, which is kind of outside my wheelhouse, but it's always fun to, to toggle with something new. And then um, some interesting case series as well, and an opinion piece. So I, I'm, I'm very good at biting off more than I can chew. I have a hard time saying no to anything, but it's a, it's a lot of fun. So um, yeah, been a computer. That's great. I feel like I'm the same way. I can't say no. 
And uh, now Ted, Ted's a man of many talents too. I, I there's some other things about Ted I didn't even know. He he plays bass and a guitar. He does some photography stuff. He does all kinds of stuff other than his doctoring and nutrition stuff. But yeah, Ted, tell us more. Oh yeah, so I'm Ted Name, and I'm a primary care doctor full time. And uh, lately, I've been um, doing some consulting for diet doctors. So that's that'll probably come up later in this discussion because <laughs> that's what we're talking about here. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's basically, I'm just like a husband, I'm a father, I'm a full-time primary care doctor. I'm doing the diet doctor thing on the side. Um, a couple other little interests you mentioned. And in the past day, I, you know, work at the clinic, uh, read some research papers. I'm super slowly writing a book on this satiety per calorie thing in the background. So I'm always working on that a little bit and that's pretty much it. Yeah. Pretty boring. What, what happened to you in the last 24 hours? Right? Oh. I mean, nothing that crazy. I just, I just had a lot. So yeah, I played sand volleyball, Zilker Park yesterday, went two-stepping with a bunch of people, uh, which I'm not a good dancer. I'm not a dancer, but I, I'm trying to challenge myself and do things that I'm not good at. I woke up, worked on the film, always a lot to do with the film. I have 600 pages of transcripts to go through. Ted being maybe a hundred of those pages. <laughs> we interviewed Ted, uh, yeah, I guess it was three weeks ago and something around there. And yeah, there's a lot. We did 10 interviews in 10 days. So now I have to highlight all those, just so much to do to get those into the script. And no one can do it for me. I can't hire this out. I can't get chat GPT to do it. I tried. <laughs> I was yeah. No, it, it's not going to work. I have to do it myself because this is just so important to get, you know, every line of this film matters. Everything is just coming from, you know, like our brains and from our angle. And I, I guess I'm saying R is in J, my director, editor, who Ted knows and, um, you know, goes around the world filming with me. So, oh, and then we had just a huge event at the Sapien Center. There was like 80 people there laying out in the sun. I was just in a sauna and a cold plunge eating venison less than 10 minutes ago. I got, that's basically it. I was sitting in a sauna with some people and I told them I have a podcast in about 12 minutes and we were just eating some fresh venison that this guy shot and we smoked it. It's incredible. And I got here, my hair's still wet. All right, so this is part of the new format. I'm gonna jump in here and give a little plug for Nose to Tail because this is all possible because of Nose to Tail. Nose to Tail.org is where you get the regenerative meat, the body care products, all kinds of stuff. This is a company I started to support this show, make it possible so I didn't have to take on other advertisers. So please support Nose to Tail. We ship to all 48 states the fresh meat. You can get a box of meat from our regenerative ranchers here in Texas. We have beef bison, pork, lamb. We got it all. And it's all done the best of the best. All the good practices, holistic management, special diets, organic feed for the pigs and chickens, low PUFA diet for them. The beef, the bison, the lamb, of course, all pasture raised, grass fed and finished and using holistic practices. Get the primal ground beef with the organs mixed in. That's the best way to get your organs. Also, we have the biltong. That's the dried meat. We have that with liver as well, the liver vorse. It's a stick version of beef jerky with no chemicals, curing agents, no added sugar, just meat and organs and a little bit of seasoning and vinegar. This is great stuff for on the go. And of course, body care, high quality stuff, beef tallow, base creams. So we now have deodorant and we have hair care. This is great stuff. I'm telling you, the hair care may be the best thing we have. I love it. I use it every single day. So go to nosetail.org, get some of our great animal-based body care products, and also sapien.org. Get the free food guide. Just enter in your email there. Get the free food guide. Super helpful for learning all this stuff. Give you an easy-to-read packet so you know how to live the sapien diet and lifestyle. Thanks for sharing with a friend, giving us a review on iTunes, and now back to the show. Super excited to be here. I love this stuff. Satiety per calorie is a big topic that I love. And some people may or may not be as into it as we are. But I think it it kind of can explain a lot about nutrition. A lot of nutrition concepts are tied into it, like nutrient density and you know, I, just a lot more. So we'll jump into it. So the next thing I want to ask each person is, I'll do two questions. The first question is, 
what do you think, what is your like idea of a healthy diet like for a day? Just do like a quick recap of what you would eat in a day that you think is a healthy way to eat and or that you do or what? Just simple. I could do mine. I eat eggs and beef sausage and avocado and sauerkraut and pickles and some cheese for lunch. I have one big lunch and then I have one big dinner and I eat maybe lamb, beef, maybe some sweet potatoes, some fruit for dessert, just big hunk of meat you know, the, the basis of each meal, two meals a day. What about you, Nick? It doesn't have to be what you do, but like, what do you think is healthy? What do you think yeah. is, yeah. I mean, it's really, I think, hard to define what a healthy diet is in something very brief because it really depends on an individual's metabolic circumstances. You know, for me, um, people may or may not know my background, but like I'm therapeutically ketogenic. So in my metabolic context or my health context, ketosis is important to me but obviously not important to everybody. What you just described sounded fantastic. I mean, in a day, what do I eat? Um, lots of olive oil, salmon, beef, eggs, um, low carb vegetables. Um, I love olives. I love macadamia nuts. I like, uh, kefir, different yogurts, cheeses. I love cheese. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are a lot of ways to skin a cat. I try not to make blanket statements on that. So, but good stuff. Awesome. And Ted, well, I'm into the protein thing, right? So every time I eat, I'm trying to target some sort of protein. So I eat a lot of, um, you know, any kind of properly raised lean animal protein, fish and seafood and lean beef and <clears throat> poultry and whatever. I eat lots of fermented, uh, low carb and low fat dairy, Greek yogurt and cottage cheese and stuff like that. And then I'm basically choosing lower carb carbs, you know, fruits and vegetables, lower fat fats, avocado, nuts and stuff like that. And uh, so I'm kind of like split down the middle on the carbon fat thing, trying to be a little bit on the low side of both of them. And for me, a healthy diet is something where the nutritional density is really high. That's protein and vitamins and minerals. And the energy density, like refined carbs and refined fats are kind of low um, just to keep you, you know, under your calorie goal, basically. So that's where I'm coming at it from. I love it. And you, you stay fit. Pretty much 24-7, 365. Every time I've seen you, you've been cut. And I mean, maybe not everyone wants to do that, but that diet is a good recipe for that, right? It's it's a bit of a cutting diet, right? It's like this low carb and low fat, essentially at the same time, keeping protein good, not, not necessarily insanely high, but high, right? Is this kind of like a cutting diet? Yeah, yeah. Basically, you're trying to, I'm trying to get the highest lean mass of the lowest fat mass. And so it's a lot of protein forward, lowish, non-protein macro kind of cutting diet. Yeah. It's pretty much your standard, uh, bodybuilding type yeah. approach, but more focus on nutrients as well. I think sometimes bodybuilders can throw that out and not really be too mindful of that. But I think you're, you're sort of like accidentally getting nutrients when you're eating your diet, as you say. Yeah. So, okay. And the next question is what, well, what do you think is the biggest factor in the obesity crisis? And we'll call it, maybe we'll just call it since 1980, there was sort of a sharper uptick in obesity prevalence in 1980. And everyone has their pet ideas and there's all kinds of factors, but I thought it'd be interesting for each person to just kind of try to, to broadly describe why you think the nation and the world started get, just gaining a lot more weight, more chronic disease. Like what happened? What changed? What is it mostly due to? Of course, there's a lot of factors. Maybe this is a hard question, but Nick, maybe you could give us like kind of your take on that. Yeah. I have actually a really hard time sticking my flagpole on the ground on this one. I think it was a if it was a question that anybody really truly understood, it would be something we had a concrete solution to. Factors that I do think are involved are um, food processing, and especially more refined carbohydrates. We do know that you know refining carbohydrates has a particular impact on their metabolic effects. There are things that go beyond that as well. So, for example, you probably saw Dana Small's new paper circulating around uh, Twitter. This came out of Yale, and it was looking at how um, the combination of fat and sugar cause um, different reward processing in the brain, even prior to gaining weight and metabolic dysfunction as an independent effect. 
I definitely think it's multifactorial and that might be a cop out, but quite honestly, um, I can name a lot of individual factors, but I don't think I can name a single factor that is the one biggest. Because I don't know how you can compare apples to oranges with that. Well, not just one thing, but I guess just describe it. Describe like what went down. What went if, down? Yeah, like what? Like describe it. Be like, yeah, it's like I'm not holding you to this. Just you know, be like, okay, this is what happened. This is what happened. This is involved. And then 40, 50 years later, we're at eighty eight percent metabolically unhealthy. You know, seventy percent obese or overweight. Whatever it is. Yeah, I think our food system has really become quite refined overall in combination with changes in the environment that make us, you know, uh, more sedentary, more stress, and all these things kind of come together to just make metabolic mayhem and make it more difficult for us to auto-regulate our intake like any other animal. Eating a species-appropriate diet generally will auto-regulate their weight to a point that is healthy for them. We evidently have failed to be able to do that. And then yeah, I think food refinement um, and just changes in our basic environment. Cool. Ted? Uh, yeah, I, I really think it's basically the refinement of carbs and fats. And there's this sort of combination of foods that's uh, high carb, high fat, lowish protein together that's just super hyper palatable and very hedonic and very addictive and people over consume it. And so you have, you know, over the past 30 years, food is, you know, four times more hyper palatable now than it was then. And that's just like all our food in general. And so people are just choosing these higher and higher carbon fat and lower and lower protein foods that basically drive overeating uh, two ways. Not only does it hedonically drive overeating because it's so tasty and delicious, but you have to passively overeat it just to get enough protein and micronutrients as well. So you have this sort of combination of hedonic overdrive and then homeostatically you have to eat more food just to get the stuff you need anyway. And I think that's just kind of pushing and pulling obesity forward steadily. And if I really had to blame one thing, it would basically be the cheap and ubiquitous refined carbs and refined fats that got dumped in the food supply and are now for economic reasons, really profitable. Um, I, I also think that <laughs> um, computers, like I don't want to blame everything on computers, but if you even looked at like a desk job 30 or 40 years ago, you had to get up and walk around like 10 X more than people do now. Like now you can just sit at a computer and email people all day long. But before you had to act, like, you know, we had filing cabinets and papers and um, you had to walk around at least a little bit. And like, I just think that nobody ever has to even move anymore um, because everything's right there. And so that is a little bit of a factor as well. Uh, yeah, no, that, that's there's something to that. Actually, I was talking to Nick about a, a paper that I wanted to write with some people about this. Like what is is it food or is it exercise? And I think food matters way more. And it's interesting because I throw these posts out on the internet, Twitter, Instagram, like the then and now photos. We have the 50s, 60s, and 70s on the beach. Everyone looks thin, right? This kind of idea that everyone was effortlessly thin, kind of what Nick was talking about. You know, species appropriate diet should auto regulate consumption and people should be, you know, have the right body composition. And then, then what changed? And everyone, when I post these, everyone just says, oh, they moved more. They did manual labor. They worked in the fields and all this stuff. And, and I'm like, yeah, I'm sure they did move more a little, like Ted was saying, but they weren't working in the fields and, and manual labor, like these jobs were, were relatively similar. And then there's like the Herman Ponser stuff too. It's like calorie expenditures constrained. And so, yeah, I, I totally agree with Ted. Like there's this, this baseline of movement has gone down, but then people do purposeful workout sessions more. I guess, or, uh, and, and just, I, I don't think we've, we're, ga we're burning that many fewer calories these days. If, if you just look at like the Herman Ponser work, his book burn, which I read, and the, he's about the Hadza and how these hunter gatherers don't actually burn that many more calories than average Americans. So I wanted to get your guys take on that. This is, uh, you know, factors in. And I think the, the humans need a baseline of movement for sure. This is just, you know, it's like, that, which is what humans need. We need some sort of baseline activity and maybe we're not hitting that, but I still think food matters way more. And uh, yeah, Ted, so w w what do you think? 
Well, I think the, well, Ponzer's totally right. The Hadza males and the U.S. males are eating and burning the exact same number of calories, just about. I mean, maybe a few hundred less for the Hadza. But uh, what the difference is that the U.S. males are just sitting on the couch and just burning a bunch of calories, maintaining a ginormous body size. And then the Hadza are like tiny and walk 20,000 steps a day. And, and I do think the diet comes first. But I think it's real easy as you're fattening with an inappropriate diet that's driving you overeating, it's real, real easy to just start moving less and less and less and less and less because you're all your caloric is, expenditure is just basal metabolic rate, maintaining a larger body size. So you got this really weird dovetailing of you're getting fatter and you're just moving less and you're still burning the same number of calories the whole time. Um, so it's I, I think those two kind of just go together, dovetail together, the getting larger and moving less just naturally go together. And then hopefully the flip side happens, getting leaner and moving more is hopefully going to happen organically too. For It seems to for anyone who loses weight and keeps it off long term. Yeah. When we were spending time with you in Seattle and we, we had many discussions with you just helping with the film on, on Zoom. And yeah, I I do appreciate that angle that I've never thought of it that way of just someone being heavier and bigger and supporting this bigger mass. They have to burn all these calories just to live and that the, it, but it's like, it's not helping them really. Right. It's not like they're uh, like, it's just, it's a wash almost. I, I don't know if that's making sense, but it, yeah. Nick, what did, what do you think about all this? I would tend to agree. I would say there is a bi-directional, um, relationship that you probably do need at least some threshold of activity to just be healthy. But I think the trouble we really run into in trying to pin down, again, the question you ask, which is more important, is a question of like scientific data gathering. What are the limitations on what we can actually measure precisely? Um, and even if we like take caloric intake, you know, Measuring that properly is really difficult. Measuring caloric output properly is really difficult. And you can really only do that, you know, for a short period of time. And so it doesn't necessarily extrapolate to the longer period of time. Something you could talk about is, say, fuel partitioning. If you're active and you're eating, you know, a well-formulated diet, so your hormones, let's just say, are in balance, then whatever calories you're eating are going to be partitioned in a different manner. So it could be partitioned in lean mass, which changes your basal metabolic rate over time. Or the foods could alter your, you know, um, let's just say body weight set point to some degree. And then there are going to be other variables in terms of energy output, like non-exercise activity thermogenesis that are, again, going to be toggled. So we're not just counting number of steps per day or how much somebody ran on a treadmill. There's heat production, uh, you know, digestion, energy, um, neat, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's a bi-directional interaction, like both you guys said. Pinning down the proper answer is something we might not ever be able to really do just because of the limitations in data collection. Like, I, yeah. I, would, I, I, don't, I don't think, I think it's an artificial thing to really have to decide. Yeah, some of these things, I don't think we're ever going to do. It's like you can't do the long-term nutrition studies and lock people in the metabolic ward and all that. I get it. Uh yeah, so I think we kind of all agree on a lot, right? I guess that's why I did all this preamble. Our diets are pretty dialed in. Most people listening have some probably version of one of our diets, really. You know, it's animal-based nutrition. It's, you know, it's it's healthier. It's not refined, you know, avoiding refined carbs or refined fats or both. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess my position on what happened is is, again, close to both of you. I love Ted for years. He's just been saying they just dump sugar flour oil and all the foods. It's just like, I love just calling it dumped. You know, it's like, we're just, they're just dumping the, these three refined ingredients with almost no nutritional value on top of the food supply. And a lot of people blame certain ingredients and Ted's kind of led me to be more unbiased and high level thinking and go, going away from any camp and being like, well, maybe it doesn't matter what you know these, these ingredients aren't uniquely toxic you know it's but as a whole being dumped on top of a whole bunch of food that uh, yeah a whole bunch of extra energy calories is going to screw you no matter what and so 
yeah what t- chad can you tell us about like like the seed oil thing like you, you're really against this idea that these seed oils are uniquely toxic there's a whole big thing especially on twitter or i don't know in certain circles that are super against the seed oils they're poison and i and i kind of thought this and maybe i still do kind of think that yeah, this is probably not a good thing to eat but you have this idea that it's just that we're eating way too much of them and of course they're dumped in everything and all the processed foods have them and it's that's why they're bad ted Uh, Yeah, right. I mean, a lot of people, it's very, very popular right now to think that linoleic acid is magically, chemically, molecularly poisoned somehow, you know, it screws up your mitochondria. And I just, I feel like if, if it really was uniquely toxic in some way that we'd see a much stronger signal of that in the medical literature. And like, honestly, if you look at the whole body of medical literature on, you know, linoleic acid and seed oils, it actually looks pretty good. It looks way better than saturated fat, pretty much any way you look at it. So I just refuse to believe that it's like some sort of unique poison, um, especially since it's essential and it's literally in every food, every food, period, full stop. So um, I think the problem is, you know, the dose makes the poison and we've just dumped such a massive quantity of these oils into the food supply. It's absurd. It's obscene. It's ridiculous. It's now like the number one source of calories. It's certainly the number one source of the calories that created the um, obesity epidemic. So we're just like eating an absurd and ridiculous amounts of these oils. And it's a great way to simultaneously both passively overeat calories like crazy. And then also make your food hedonically um, better. So you're just overeating. That's why, you know, restaurant vegetables taste way better than my vegetables because they just douse everything in oil. And we know from animal studies, you can pretty much fatten up any animal by just pouring oil on its food. So I think it's not uniquely, uh, molecularly toxic. I just think it's just so ubiquitous now that it's a, a sheer quantity problem. Yeah. It's super interesting. Not a popular opinion, but and a lot of people like to show those graphs and I like to show these graphs of the all the things it's like, oh, sugar actually has been going down a little, but the seed oils have gone up directly with obesity. And I think Ted's stance is that, yeah, these are just all these extra energy calories that are giving zero nutrition and just causing obesity, causing metabolic harm, causing all these things, Not be maybe not because there, there's anything wrong with them, they're just excess. It's absolute zero nutrition and just absolute extra metabolic you know, overload. What do you think, Nick? Um, on the seed oil topic, I'd say more so than not, I agree with Ted. I actually had a quite extensive thread a little while ago on seed oil extremism on Twitter because I do think it's it's overblown. Um, I think that there are a lot of extreme positions that have just become overly hyperbolic to the point where people are like, I don't want to eat a raw nut because it has omega-6 in it and omega-6 mm-hmm. is bad. Or I've literally had people like comment on the olive oil I eat. It's like, oh, all that linoleic acid, I'm like, fine um so yeah i would say overall i I agree i don't think i think the dose makes the poison i would say i don't think it's just the calories associated with linoleic acid in highly processed vegetable oils that are quite ubiquitous that's problematic i think there is something to the oils themselves being fragile being taken out of the natural food being oxidized and that contributing to an inflammatory state they've actually done studies if we want to like talk about the animal models the funny thing about linoleic acid, the omega-6 and omega-3s is their essential fatty acid. So you can't actually do a controlled human study where you separate the omega-6 to 3 ratio in the diet from the actual diet because you have to modify other components of the diet to change the ratio. But you can do animal studies where you provide these animals with enzymes so that they can interconvert these, these, um, these omegas. And if you do modify the ratios, you do change uh, body composition in the animal inflammatory state. So I think the dose makes the poison. Um, I think that a little bit of linoleic acid is not going to kill you. Don't not eat raw nuts because of the linoleic acid. Um, but I think that there is something inflammatory and metabolic going on with excess intake of these, particularly in the context of mixed diets, where there's also typically a lot of refined um, uh, sh- grains and, and sugar, mm. as in the now studies. Uh, Ted, I think you, you, you sent me some papers that I never was able to read 
that might be opposing that thing that that idea that they can become oxidized i think tell me more um no i mean i don't i don't really know that i disagree necessarily with that i do think oxidation is probably a major concern especially if you're you know deep frying and reusing these oils i think it is something that <clears throat> could possibly be problematic i just uh, again am not i feel like that's more of a one percent problem and the the elephant in the room is literally just the volume that we're consuming of these things so yeah i mean that would be you know the oxidation thing is kind of a theoretical concern when like the crazy amount of calories from oils we're eating is like very real and in your face all day every day yeah I like the elephant in the room approach or the 80 20 or like whatever moves a needle type of thing. Yeah. I mean, we could get in the weeds about almost anything. So it's like, if we're trying to just help people change their lifestyle and change their habits and, you know, make broad messaging. I, I love that approach of just, let's just tell people some simple rules or give them some simple information and that could go a long way. And then later they can nerd out and listen to, you know, some podcast that's two hours about every little detail, but to move the needle, we don't have to do a lot. And we just need to have these like simple things. And that kind of leads into the satiety stuff. Uh, super into the satiety concept. Satiety per calorie is this idea that all foods have a satiety per calorie. And that my idea of it is that all whole foods pretty much have the correct satiety per calorie that if you eat this food, you are full for the correct amount of time. Doesn't matter how many, you know, the, the calories are sort of arbitrary to me. It's like, okay, well, this piece of lettuce has like three calories and this steak has like 500, but I'm full for the correct amount of time if I eat this steak or this lettuce. And that when you get into the processing of foods, that's where the satiety per calorie drops. And you get to the, the worst example is like a soda. It's like all the calories, no satiety. No one's like, hey, I drank a soda six hours ago. I'm still full. You know, it, it does almost nothing for satiety. It could have actually just create even more hunger, right? If you can have this like blood sugar roller coaster going up and then going hypoglycemic and, you know, being even hungrier after you drink the soda. So, uh, and then processed foods would be somewhere in the middle. So that's kind of the, the satiety per calorie thing. Is that how you think of it, Ted? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it has nothing to do with, you know, how many calories anybody should be eating. Like I, if you're eating, you know, 6,000 calories a day, that's awesome. If your weight's stable, that means you're just exercising a ton. That's great. But, um, it really comes down to, you know, are you eating foods that are, um, either hedonically driving overeating or just passively you have to eat more because you didn't get maybe enough protein or weight and volume to your food or something. Uh, for whatever reason, people are choosing these foods that just sound healthy to them. And they're, what's, it, what's happening is they don't realize the satiety per calorie is pretty low. And so you're just basically gonna gain weight on these foods. And you know, I, have, I have so many patients who are like, wow, I don't know why I just keep gaining weight because you know, my diet's so healthy. I, you know, I buy the, you know, the whole wheat bread and the whole grain cereal and I buy the you know, low fat mayo. And I have like, you know, they're, they're buying these things that have some sort of health labeling to them, but they're just yeah. absolute garbage from any kind of satiety per calorie mindset. And um, I think that a lot of people get confused by all the messaging out there. Oh, well, it's all about, you know, you should be vegan, you should be plant-based. If you're getting fatter, it's because you're eating animals, you know you shouldn't be eating animals. Mm -hmm. Or it's like, oh, well, it's all about the carbs. You know, everybody knows that carbs are what make people fat. So as long as you just don't eat carbs, you're fine. And so people get all these mixed messages. And this is just an attempt to try to kind of fit everything into one general framework. You know what I mean? That kind of makes sense, hopefully, to some people out there. Yeah, exactly. Nick, what do you think? I want to highlight a few things each of you said um, over the past couple of statements. First, you, Brian, about the importance of being able to communicate to people in general, simple things that they could do average lay person, you know, how do I think about this? And then Ted, you use the frame, the term mindset. I think that there is something very important to being able to communicate to people and teach them. I think that's like what we need to be focusing on doing. But I want to distinguish that from a scientific model 
and a scientific understanding. Because when I come to satiety per calorie, I love it as a heuristic, as an abstraction, as a mindset, something like mindful eating. When you reflect on how much a food fills you up, how much nutrient density it gives you, given whatever dietary practice you want to adopt, be it carnivore or vegan, um, you know, that, that makes sense to me. And I think it is a good mindset. I think the trouble arises with satiety per calorie when you actually try to pin it down as a scientific model, which diet doctors now are trying to do. I think that's when things really do start to fall apart because you're forcing direct comparisons. You're inviting direct comparisons among food and the variables you have to plug in the, the basis of data we have to kind of plug into what would be a satiety per calorie algo is very rudimentary. And I don't think at this point in time, something that is, is really feasible. Even if we assume that SPC was a complete model, which I, I also don't think it is. I think it's one lever like many others. Percent protein in the diet is important. I think you could talk about a lot of levers people could pull, but it's incomplete and difficult to scientifically operationalize. Good abstraction, not great in execution. What's a fair point? And yeah, I mean, I've, I've discussed this kind of independently with both of you or with Andreas, that maybe the idea to assign a scoring system is never going to work no matter what <laughs> for anything. And I've tried to do this for years. I was like, oh, we could do a nutrient density scoring system and then you can mm -hmm. poke holes in it. So I don't know if scoring systems are ever going to work, especially with mixed foods. So Ted, I'll give you a chance to respond. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I'm very humble about the fact that this is completely arbitrary. It's totally made up. Nobody's ever done this before. We're absolutely pulling this out of thin air. The uh, I'm a mechanical engineer, and, and in mechanical engineering, what you do is you you just build something, you make it, and then it, if it just completely like blows up or just falls apart, that's awesome. That's great. You've learned something and then you build it again and it's slightly better. And then it just like completely implodes one more time. And then you build it again and you keep doing this. You use the best information you have and you keep iterating. And eventually you have something that's actually pretty good. And so many things in engineering are like this, where you just make something and then iterate on it. And that's really what satiety per calorie and the algorithm is. It's completely manufactured and made up, but everything in it is evidence-based directionally. And what nobody knows is how it all fits together or if it all fits together. So we make this and then we compare it to existing data. And if it completely falls apart and doesn't work, we have to retool it and change it. And so it's definitely... Um, a work in progress. It's very early. It literally changes all the time and it's going to continue to change. But the overall concept, the really big picture concept, I think is extraordinarily valuable. And the nice thing about the way it's being implemented here is that anything that shows up that doesn't fit, we can basically change our approach to make it fit that data, if you know what I mean, which kind of like eventually after enough iterations, it might actually be pretty helpful. I mean, I'm not saying that it's absolutely not scientific right now. It's absolutely not proven. It's uh, It could be extremely wrong and bad, but it will basically have to get better and it has already and it will continue to. So um, should we just wait until it's absolutely perfect and then roll it out? Um, I think if everybody did that with everything, nothing would ever get made. So, yeah, I'm 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 all about just like process improvement because I don't know about you guys, but my whole um, diet and exercise career, I've made changes constantly just based on new data that I got, and I'm always trying to have the most up to date, most correct, least wrong version with the data that I've got at the time. So I can't wait for something to be perfect. I just have to go with what I've got and iterate when new things come along. Hopefully this is an open-minded approach that will be kind of open to any new data that, that influences it. I love that. I love that. That's, that's kind of how I roll and I have a mechanical engineering background as well. And yeah, I like to, you, you, I like to go think 
at things from different sides too. It's like, well, you go from this way and then you can back into it a different way. It's like, let's back into this by doing this and directionally we can do this. But I'm going to give a little more context to satiety per calorie because I don't know if we even finished describing it or the audience even kind of knows what we're talking about before I let Nick go. But it, the idea, my idea of why people gain weight is it's this slow battle of hunger and it's this very slow process. The body doesn't have a calorie sensing mechanism, really. It has a satiety sensing mechanism. This is like, I'm full or I'm not. That's what we have. We don't have this, you know, we're not like a bomb calorimeter, whatever it's called. You know, we don't know exactly what calories are in our body. We kind of made that up. But we do know is when we're full, when we're hungry, and most people want to lose weight and they can't. And no one wants to overeat, but they are. So why are they overeating? That's why this calories in, calories out is meaningless to me. Eat less, move more. Meaningless. It doesn't tell anyone why or how to do it. And so to me, the satiety can explain a lot of this. I'm not saying it does explain the entire obesity crisis, but it can explain the entire obesity crisis is that slowly people are passively overeating energy calories because their protein and nutrients are low. The nutrient density is low. There's extra refined fats and carbs in their diet. And they're just having to overeat energy calories to get those protein and nutrient requirements. And it's just very slow process. And it happens a pound a year, right? That sort of thing happens. Next thing you know, you're 30 pounds overweight. And it it's just, it, it's it's sort of this elegant way to explain what goes on. People are losing this battle of hunger slowly. And it's so slow. That's why it's so hard. You can't measure it. You can't pin it down. That's why no one's talking about this except for a few nerds on Twitter like us. So uh, Nick, um, how, do, how do you want to respond yes. to Ted and I'll comment on that? Yeah, I, I think it is about how it's being pitched. I mean, you just said very clearly, look, this is completely made up, non-scientific. And that's true. But then why are claims being made like satiety per calorie explains every observable phenomenon in the diet space, period, which is a direct quote. And I'm getting these, and I think people in general on Twitter are commenting, look, there are very strong, decisive claims that were being made about satiety per calorie, even though it is non-scientific, it's unvalidated. And I think the process needs to require some degree of validation, background iteration, and scientific process before it's released to the public. Because Diet Doctor has such an, it's such an amazing resource, or at least historically has been, that a lot of people trust. To just roll something out, to pretend that it's science when it's not, and then just kind of like broadly beta test, I think that's potentially harmful, especially when the output is incredibly problematic. Now, maybe the fury and negative feedback that people provide on social media will let you iterate it. So um, earlier versions that have then been adapted were like, okay, I don't think apple juice should be better than meat. You replied, okay, I'm going to change that. But there are so many of these examples. The last iteration I looked at, it's like, okay, um, watermelon is worse for weight loss than pizza. Coke is better for weight loss than extra virgin olive oil. Popcorn with yeast better than like salmon. All these things, like, there's always examples and examples. And that's just talking about individual food to food. Furthermore, when you have to like, you talk about, the scientific basis being directionally import, like directionally correct, as in higher percent protein. I do think protein is a great lever or higher fiber. People debate on fiber, but I probably would agree like on a population level, higher fiber would be more satiating. Yeah, those are two levers, but you can't toss that together with the hedonic factor, which is completely arbitrary and individualistic and assume the output is going to be something that is useful. It's like saying... I have a steering wheel and a front right tire. So together they make a functional car. Like there's so much more that goes into satiety. So again, great abstraction. But when you try to pin it down and put a score on it, my impression is they're going to inevitably be like always poor comparisons, specifically when you start to mix diets, because, um, well, first of all, you're not really looking at, endocrinology, how things interact. You're not looking at, we're talking about nutrient density. That's not a component in the algorithm as far as I'm aware. I don't think micronutrients are included. 
I think my impression is this percent protein, fiber, and then a hedonic factor, whatever that is. And then arbitrarily toggling the weights on those to generate an output. It, it seems like something that needs to be validated in a scientific process and can be harmful if unrolled in the way it's being unrolled, quite honestly. I know I have strong feelings about this, but I'd rather Ted, not blanket those. What do you got, Ted? <clears throat> well, okay, and and I totally, I'm completely on board with the fact that nobody's combined these things together. We really just don't know exactly what is, you know, we don't know whether protein percent is more important than energy density. We don't know if fiber per thousand grams of calories is more important than protein percent. We don't know exactly how much these hedonic factors um, influence everything else. We, we, these are being made up in terms of the weighting, although there is the, the pushbacks I would give is that the individual levers we're using are very well validated scientifically and are definitely evidence-based for sure. And the other thing I'll say is that, you know, Diet Doctor has been a great low carb resource, but, you know, historically we, we've had a Diet Doctor guides that showed like how much carb was in a food, lower is better all the way to zero. And so your best snacks are like, you know, you know, heavy cream and macadamia nuts and full fat cheese. And I don't, and I think that at some point, like you, you could almost say if, if you're not in the low carb dogma world, you could almost say some of that starts to get non-helpful, not really bad, but possibly less than optimal as you get to the extremes of low carbon, high fat. And so I think that this approach is basically just a little bit more broadly applicable and also tends to um, kind of include some other phenomenon that we see out there in the real world with plant-based diets or low fat diets or low energy density diets or other diets that are extremely successful. And the other thing I will say is that, um, are you aware of any observable phenomenon in the diet space that wouldn't be explained with this sort of satiety per calorie mindset. I'm not saying specific examples where the calculator is giving ridiculous results, but I mean, just in general. Yeah, I can respond to on, on all those points. First of all, on the, the data end of these things, like, yeah, there are a lot of examples of things that aren't explainable by satiety per calorie. You can talk about the Framingham food study where, okay, protein cell equal, you modify macronutrient content and you change total energy expenditure. You can talk about um, like, you know, metabolic health independent of weight, the hide it all randomized control trial, holding calories the same, manipulating macronutrients and reversing metabolic syndrome in the lower carb group. You could talk about microbiome impacts. There was that Suez et al. 2022 paper looking at artificial sweeteners and the impact on the microbiome, which impacts like glycemic control, which will have downstream or could have downstream impacts on weight. I mean, the blanket statement of satiety per calorie explains every observable phenomenon in the diet space period is easily falsifiable. And on the topic of this whole directionality, you were giving the examples of, yeah, well, if you're saying let's just have lower carb stuff and then people are chucking heavy cream. Well, I agree that's not a good idea, but you could apply that to satiety per calorie easily. I mean, a Diet Coke score is a perfect 100. It's like the highest you could have. So satiety per calorie, is it encouraging having Diet Coke? I mean, you have to provide people with information. And carbohydrate content is like an objective, objective, quantifiable thing that then they can incorporate into designing a diet. But trying to sum it up with one universal score that really does have a value statement on it, I think is problematic. And to preface or to kind of preempt where this conversation might go, I know the topic of central balance has come up on satiety per calorie, where, okay, the ideal isn't shooting for 100, it's maybe shooting for 50. I know Andreas has said 50 as, quote, evolutionarily normal. Now, I don't know where 50 as evolutionarily normal came from, but if you want to run with that, then other problems present because you're not really discriminating between the quality of foods. I think beef tacos are a 48. They're pretty much hitting the nail on the head. And I can design a horrible diet that has a 50 and a very good diet that has a 50. 
Um, and satiety per calorie doesn't discriminate those because you're not putting those variables into the calculator. Um, well, I'm just curious what your, uh, okay. So, um, uh, part of the satiety per calorie calculation is basically objectively demonstrating how many grams of fiber are present per thousand calories, the protein percentage of your food, um, and the energy density of your food. Um, I, I think you would agree that just seeing those parameters individually, in a purely objective scientific fashion is valuable maybe to some people when they're trying to choose foods for their diet. Um, I, I'm ignoring at the moment the hedonic score, which is completely fabricated, and the combination of the scores, which is also weighted in a completely you know made up artificial way. But you would say that knowing energy density, fiber, and protein percent would be helpful in basically designing a diet i think if you take those individually and give those to people they then can use those very clear objective pieces of data and their background knowledge to inform dietary choices yes okay so so you like like the carbohydrate percentage that diet doctors had or still has um you like the uh energy density information being visible and that's useful. You like the protein percent, you like the fiber, um, but you just don't like the com combining them all together because you think that's probably just not going to be, that could be bad somehow. Yeah. And I'll explain exactly how I kind of already alluded to it again with the analogy, but what you're doing is you're taking a couple tiny pieces of the puzzle, putting them together and pretending it's the whole puzzle the satiety per calorie. Again, the analogy of if I gave you a steering wheel and a single tire, you don't have a car. You just have, a, you know, two pieces of what could be a larger machine. But satiety per calorie is so much more complex. Obesity is so much more complex. So throwing it together into a score, tacking on a hedonic factor there, and pretending that it's a model that explains everything isn't useful. Why not just give people the little bits of objective data and, you know, let them use that as they will. And I actually think even better than percentages is just like raw grams. Um, so why not just do that? What, what is the value add to combining them? Because I can definitely see a downside. It's clearly generating some scores that are extremely problematic and misleading to people um, who, who may or may not be convinced that, okay, Coke is actually better for weight loss than olive oil. Like, if you have a Coke at a 9 and an olive oil at a 5, really what you're saying is, like, in terms of designing a meal, I could say, okay, I'm going to have a salad with some olive oil on it and some salmon. But you know what? I kind of feel like something sweet, so I'm going to not have the oil. I'm just going to have a plain salad with salmon, but now I can have a Coke. And those things are equivalent, which they're clearly not. But satiety per calorie would say they are. Or that actually the Coke is better. Um, honestly, every single number you've quoted right now is from data that was in a version like a year ago. <laughs> so that that's not this was from not the way. From last week. Um, right. I mean, the, we, the the calculator has iterated so many times, and some of the stuff posted on the website has been there for months. And so, um, yeah, the, the scores you're quoting are no longer. Accurate. I mean, that's what, not, that's all we're reading. Patients, the entire patient population of diet doctor is seeing. That's what's available. If you, you know, it's an opaque algorithm, things behind a paywall, and you're not putting the current scores. People can only give feedback on what's publicly available. So these are the scores that are publicly available. Well, yes, that's true. And, and these need to be upgraded. But um, I guess what I was going to say is that you're right. There's an infinite number of factors. You could never possibly hope to quantify them all. Everything matters. Everything's important. It's absurdly complicated. No one could ever objectively quantify anything, even remotely, into a score. And yet, what people have got to work with right now is just don't eat carbs. Just be low carb. The lower, the better. Uh, how about zero? How about keto? How about carnivore? How about don't ever eat plants? Uh, or it's just like, oh, you just eat plants only. Don't eat any animals. Uh, 
I would say in terms of an objective scoring system or a series of rules that I'd like to see something better than satiety per calorie. I'd like to see something better. I, I would love that. I would really learn from that. I would probably try to reverse engineer it and steal it and incorporate it into, into satiety per, per um, calorie. So yeah, show me something better. I would absolutely love to see it. I would love to see a better heuristic for uh, food choices. But again, you can go to heuristic and abstraction. You're, you're trying to Im- impose something universal that like there, there isn't a central answer right now. There is nothing that is going to be like, okay, we'll just go to this and we're going to have something simple for the population. It's about informing people and providing like options based on objective data and reason. And so like, yeah, if you want to flex that a salmon and broccoli dinner is better than cheesecake and like pancakes. I mean, I don't really think that you need a scoring system for that. And yeah, I think there's also an issue of, and you pointed this out, this is something we totally agree on, extremism in any single diet camp. I think that's problematic, but I don't think that the way to combat it is just to make something up that's completely arbitrary. We, we need to be very nuanced in how we discuss these models. So, you know, I know that I think you both each say have issues with the carbohydrate insulin model. We could poke holes in that. I don't think it's a complete model. And I think it's important to talk about how we translate that into practical advice for people and what matters and what doesn't matter. But I also have confidence that people are smart enough to actually understand that translation. And it doesn't need to be wrapped up into let's just give a number to everything. I, I, I fundamentally don't think that's a good approach. But But I will say, this is actually a discussion I had the other day, because since I've been more vocal on scoring systems, now two companies have approached me about their scoring systems. And what I've said to them is, look, I'm happy to work with you and try to poke holes. I don't think you're ever going to come to a scoring system that is that good. I think this is a fundamentally flawed approach. However, at least one of them has committed to not going public with their system until they demonstrate it has use in a randomized controlled trial. And there, I give credit. I don't need satiety per calorie to be perfect, but I think, you know, it needs to be demonstrated to be useful. Right now, I think it looks not useful, potentially harmful. But, and this was, we had a private conversation, I was very clear about this, like, look, if this is demonstrated useful against a strong control group, then I'm all for it. But at, we're not at that point. We're not even anywhere close to that point. And as far as I'm aware, those efforts aren't really being made. And I could be wrong. And if I'm wrong, then I'd love to know about the study design. And I think people in general would love to know, you know, what's actually going on behind the scenes, because a lot of this is opaque. All I'm seeing is really weird scores that I think not just me, but a lot of people are kind of upset about. Um, because there's a population of people who really trust a diet doctor who kind of see it as a betrayal of what was once a great scientific resource. <laughs> I, well, you're right. A lot of uh, dogmatic cult-like low-carb people are upset with anything that's not just all about carbohydrates. So wait, 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 wait. That that's, that's not a fair evaluation. I mean, I gave you examples of higher-carb foods that are score like a watermelon versus a pizza. On the last scoring system I looked at, said pizza was better for weight loss. Watermelon is not low carb. But if I had to say to somebody, do you want to eat watermelon or pizza for weight loss? Please have the watermelon. This isn't a a low carb dogma thing. So like you can't pit this against low carb dogma. We can talk about the science. This is in and of itself a dogmatic approach. That is not scientific. So you said that you know that salmon and broccoli is better than cheesecake. And why why is that and how would you explain that to somebody in a real simple fashion if you wanted something that was really easily understood um what would what would be your explanation sure salmon is you know a great source of healthy omega-3 fatty acids and protein um broccoli also has micronutrients and you could even go i know where you're going with this these are foods that will also help you feel full for longer which is true, as opposed to cheesecake, which has fewer nutrients, and you'll probably be hungry after eating it. But 
that didn't require a quantification. It required someone who was going to listen to me for two seconds and quite honestly, just not be stupid. <laughs> that like it, it just doesn't pass the stupid test, but it doesn't need a number. Oh, would, would it be fair to say that you could explain it as the salmon and the broccoli has a higher protein percent, more micronutrients, um, less caloric density, less carbs and fats, uh, less hedonic factor, and a higher satiety per calorie, so you'll just automatically eat less? And then would it be fair to sort of vaguely rank where how much better – the satiety per calorie from the broccoli and the sandwich would be compared to the cheesecake. And even if you had just three giant buckets to put them in, like really high and good, really bad and low, and then just somewhere in the middle, if you even vaguely knew that the salmon and broccoli was in the high zone and the cheesecake was in the low zone, do you think that would be something that would be helpful and most people could instantly understand and get it and kind of learn the system and just, you know, end up making decisions like based on these factors. I mean, because I think that the exact number is not that important, but the general concept of like, this is too high, that's too low, and this is sort of Goldilocks um, is kind of valuable. I mean, I, I don't know that exact numbers like are going to be ever agreed upon by everybody, but directionally, it seems like a useful metric. I see that's where I'm going to have to, again, push back because I don't think that there's a value add because the salmon and the broccoli versus the cheesecake, you didn't need to say, okay, let's not even put a number on it. Let's say green for good or red for bad. It doesn't take someone who has a background in nutrition or a PhD or an MD to know that. They know that. And if they don't know that, then you actually have a much more fundamental problem. You need to sit, that, sit down with that patient and kind of explain to them the principles behind it. Which is but that's not example. what's being done here. You're kind of smushing it together and actually giving a precise score. So the idea of bucketing it is is a distinct idea. And, you know, are you implying that you intend to change the satiety per calorie system to a three buckets model? Or, as I actually suggested before, um, I, I suggested one way to improve it, not something, doesn't mean I love the model, but would be to have error bars, which would again be arbitrary. But then at least, and this is something that, you know, I, I shared privately, look, there are a lot of ways to attack this that are very, very easy. Putting error bars on something would at least make it more difficult to be like, look, you're actually scoring like butter worse than cheesecake or pizza, you know, better than watermelon. Because right now you're putting finite numbers on it and that's inviting comparisons. And sure, one can cherry pick good or one can cherry pick bad comparisons but generally if you cherry pick the good comparisons that doesn't pass the stupid test so what's the value add and it's fair to cherry pick the bad comparisons because the tool is making the claim based on putting a precise number without error bars on it that coke is better than olive oil etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's still disregarding the fact that we haven't even gotten into the complexities of what happens when you start to mush things together because then it's treating foods like Oreos and olive oil as biological equivalent dilution factors, which they are clearly not. So again, my question, is there a value add? Because I don't see it. So I think it's really easy when you're looking at cheesecake versus salmon, but uh, with some foods that are a little bit more in the middle, and a lot of people don't really instinctively know this, like, you know, your patient comes to you and they're eating a, a kind bar or something for a snack, right? It's just nuts. It's got like four ingredients. Um, you know, why are they not losing weight? I think uh, some of these things could be, uh, you know, a lot more confusing to people besides the three of us. And it might be nice to know um exactly where those foods lined up with other options. You know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of foods in the middle. I mean, it's very easy to look at things like Oreos are bad and kale is good, but most of the foods we eat are somewhere in the middle and it would be kind of nice to know, oh, this food's maybe not that great because the protein percent is pretty low. Did you know that? Or this food might not be that great because the energy density is super high. I mean, there are so many things in the middle that it might be kind of nice to know what's better than what. And uh, we did look at, we had a lot of focus groups look at, you know, should we just have broader categories since uh, having a very exact number 
is a little bit ridiculous. Like if we had a decimal point out to the thousands, it would start to get super ridiculous. And so we did toss around having bigger categories and there could be an argument for that. But most of the focus group people just kind of liked the cleanness of a, just a straight zero to 100 number. So that's what we're going with. I, there might be a better approach. I admit that. But you just totally pivoted. You just said we want big buckets or it only makes sense to make sense to look at things in big buckets buckets but now you're saying oh but there are things that are actually pretty close and we want to be able to discriminate between them and okay so first of all and maybe that isn't a pivot but you can clarify why it isn't second of all like you gave the example of a kind bar well i would just talk to the person about what is actually in that kind bar because you know it's a lot of sugar and people might not realize that but let's turn the label over to look at the ingredients and say, oh, look, you know, that actually has, you know, 20 grams of sugar. Maybe that's a problem. And that, again, is providing them with information about how to read a nutrition label rather than just saying, okay, go on our tool, this bar gets to this score. You know, like, give me an example of actually two foods that the average layperson would be like, okay, I don't know which one's better, but there's clearly a choice that we think was better. And this tool is going to provide them an ability to discriminate between those that, you know, they wouldn't otherwise be able to discriminate between those. What is that example? Can I jump in? Because that's what I was going to say earlier, that the cheesecake and the salmon and the, the broccoli, those are, that's an extreme example. And yes, 99% of people could just make that decision without a tool. But if you take, oh, okay, here's this pasta with vegetables, just a whole bunch, you get a giant bowl of noodles and some vegetables, and then you got like beef and eggs. Most people, they would choose the pasta with vegetables. They're like, that's a healthy option. And with the tool, that's what I think that's what Ted means is in the middle. This was these foods are very not in the middle. Like you could easily tell with this tool the difference between those foods. Ted? Yeah. And so a lot of this for me is an evolution of my own diet experience, right? So for many years, I would just tell patients, oh, it's just all about the carbs. Just don't eat carbs. You'll be fine. You'll lose a ton of weight. And then I realized, uh, well, the problem there is that when people aren't eating carbs, they're um, still able to overeat on, you know, cheese and nuts and these high energy density foods. And then I was like, well, okay, it has to be paleo or it has to be carnivore. Um, and now I'm at the point where even if foods fit these categories, they might not be great for satiety per calorie. I mean, you have something like a, like a pork rind, right, where the, it's, you know, 50% protein. Um, no carbs at all. You would think it would be great for fat loss, but the it, because it's dehydrated and there's no water present in it at all, it has absurdly high energy density and uh, nobody's losing weight on pork rinds. And this is the sort of thing that I wouldn't really know until I actually look at these components of satiety per calorie. And that might really help you fraction it out like a pork rind versus a beef jerky versus like an actual piece of meat. And when you start looking at the, the water content of all three of these, you realize, wow, these dehydrated things are really not that great. Even though it's pure meat, totally great ingredients, super high protein percent. Um, and, and those are the sorts of things where I think it's actually helpful to kind of know where they gradiate out. Um, e even if the differences are fairly small, and even if our numbers are made up and artificial, directionally, you know, the meat with a higher with 70% water is going to be way better than jerky, which is going to be better yet than a pork rind. And sure enough, that's kind of what, what you see in real life. So, um, I mean, there are lots of examples of like, you know, different types of a product, like different types of pasta. Uh, look at the satiety score on a black bean pasta versus like a whole wheat pasta versus a regular pasta. I mean, there's definitely a gradient there. And these are the kind of things where I think these foods are sort of in the middle. And having a score difference, even if it's arbitrary and made up, and we don't know if it's exact or not, we know that directionally, these are probably going to be applicable. So it just seems like a useful metric. Sure, it's not completely validated, but uh, you know we're doing the best we can with the data that we've got. But so before you go, wait, 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 wait. Can, like all these examples that have just been provided, including your yours, Brian, was interesting because you're saying, okay, the person choosing the pasta with vegetables versus the beef and eggs. The heuristic, if you want to call it that, of low carb actually probably would explain that better. So it's an interesting example to choose. But like in terms of all the examples that have been provided, why not just tell the person 
the principles upon which the choices are based, like you just explained. That seems to actually provide them with useful information that they could use to make a decision. So you're talking about the black bean pasta versus just the regular pasta. Turn the label over. Look, it's higher in protein. It's higher in fiber. It's generally higher in nutrients. Why not just tell them that? Why wrap it up into a score that is pseudoscience and try to sell them on that point instead? People don't. Like all the information's there. People need simple. uh, People like these three people want insane nuance and all these details. People listening to this podcast, next level down, they probably want this. General people, they're, they they got no time. I talk to these people all the time. I'm out in the world nonstop making this film full time, six years. I talk to thousands and thousands of people. They're clueless. They don't care. They got no time. They need simple. And I just want to say, actually, b- before we move on, because I wanted to, we didn't accurately and fully describe Ted's view of satiety either, because we didn't talk about the volume of food, which which includes the prote- uh, the water and the fiber, because that's important. We did not talk about that yet. Some people listening, they're like, oh, this guy keeps going on and on about fiber. Uh, you know, it's not like Ted's like a vegan that's like obsessed with fiber. <laughs> Ted's saying that fiber is, well, I think of it like there's long-term satiety and protein and minerals and vitamins and, and some fats contribute to long-term satiety and there's kind of short-term satiation, which is stomach fullness and that water content and fiber content food can help that. And Ted always says humans eat three to four pounds of food per day, pretty much no matter what. And so you, it can be a good lever to have the fiber, the water in the food to feel full, right? A lot of people, even I, I have limited experience seeing clients, uh, you know, do, I work with Dr. Gary a little, I see some people just to learn. Right. And what I see, they're like, hey, I went carnivore. I can eat a thousand steaks. I, I can eat and eat and eat and eat. And Ted's seen this. He's seen over 100,000 patients. I get it. These people can eat and eat and eat. A lot of people have problems with food. There, you know, there's eating disorders. There's all kinds of energy around this. And so I think they, some people need to, if they added some bulk into their diet, like pickles and sauerkraut, maybe they can stop eating at the correct time because their stomach's full and then the the beef and the fat will carry them for the long-term satiety and then they can get that short-term you know stomach stretch from the fiber and the water ted did i describe that accurately yeah i I mean that's that's absolutely right and honestly i do see that in my patients who have been you know very low carb or carnivore for a long time they basically never eat any plant foods and uh, i think a couple things happen there first of all you just can't get as much weight and volume as you can with plants. I mean, like, like for example, like a carrot, right? You, you, the biggest carrot you've ever seen in your life, you know, maybe 150 grams, that's 37 calories. You would have to eat 18 pounds of carrots to have your daily amount of calories for the average human on earth. And so I have all these people who they don't, they haven't eaten a carrot for years. So they wouldn't eat a carrot. This is like, just absolutely not on their menu. Uh, yet I'm like, hey, why don't you try snacking on something like this where you're gonna get an absurd weight of vo- and volume uh, of food for almost no calories. And maybe that would add a little something to the satiety that you're not getting by just eating more you know, fat or uh, you know, something like that. And so I do think, yeah, the, the, the things that are evidence-based in the medical literature to improve society for calorie, there's about 10 of them. And it's more higher protein, higher fiber, higher water, higher micronutrients like potassium and calcium. It's lower uh, fat, it's lower energy density, it's lower carbs, it's lower alcohol. You're basically getting all the micronutrients higher and all the uh, non-protein macronutrients lower. And we have studies on all of these. They're all evidence-based. They're all validated. They all have been shown to work. Um, we are cobbling them together. But like, like you said, Nick, I love what, you're tell- what you said before about we need to teach people about all these factors. And that's exactly what we're trying to do is say, hey, this is why this has a score it does. Look at the protein percent. Look at the fiber. Look at the energy density. And look at how hedonic this is. And so we're drawing attention to the individual components and just raising awareness. And so people can look at something and say, oh, wow, you know, grapes are a 33 and raisins are a 12. That's because all the water has gone. And I could eat, you know, if I ate, you know, uh, 
20 grapes. I'm pretty full, but if I eat 20 raisins, it's like, what? So I think these things are being educated to people with this whole concept. And I think it is valuable, even if the exact numbers are wildly wrong, you know, directionally, they're all correct. And, and when you look at a spectrum of foods, you are going to have things like grapes are better than raisins. And you're going to have things like, you know, uh, regular meat is higher than jerky. And you're going to have things like low carb versions of everything is better than the real version. Um, and these are all, we know these, uh, these work in the real world. So I think it's useful. I, but, but you're not like, you're not by smushing them together. You are obscuring the individual components. Why not then just have a nutrient profile for individual foods? And I also, again, I don't think that these are directionally accurate scores. I don't know how popcorn with nutritional yeast is better than salmon. I, I don't, I don't know where that comes from. That seems nutritionally incorrect, but maybe it is nutritionally correct. And it just needs to be validated. I could be wrong on that, but it just seems made up. And and again, there's this this idea of there are so many more factors in this that are being obscured by smushing them together, including nutrient density. Um, again, the car with the one wheel and the, the driving wheel. Like it's not a car. And you can't say that I I, I can go on and I can calorie weight foods that are on this even if we take foods that are actually like probably reasonably scored should a cookie in an oreo be a zero overall yeah i think that's a reasonable individual score but then you take something that's just like pure fat like an olive oil and then you can actually kind of engineer a meal that is complete junk food crap that scores a 50 versus like you could take beef tacos and french fries a diet coke and some broccoli and then compare it to like some eggs fried in butter and then the former fast food meal could actually score way better. And so practically, when you're implementing a scoring system like this, like that's what people are going to see. If you want to educate people, educate them about each of these factors. That's fine. But that's not what this tool is doing. And, and I, I'll admit there, there's been tons of like, I, you know, mis, full blown mistakes in the posting of these scores that, or things that were just completely ridiculously mismatched. Like popcorn being an 80, it turns out that this was, we were calculating this for two cups of air pop popcorn and a quarter cup of nutritional yeast. And I don't know what kind of vegans putting a quarter cup of nutritional yeast on two cups of popcorn. So that was like absolutely not very helpful. And so there are a lot of things that have been posted that are super early, very tentative, possibly wrong. And, and I think we deserve to have you like, screenshot those and plast them all over Twitter because they are like totally ridiculous and completely wrong. And I actually love that feedback. And I know that we're iterating on all of these things and cleaning up mistakes like that and making it better. And so I like this feedback is actually super valuable and I really appreciate it. And, and already it's, it's led to a lot of, um, a lot of really good improvements. So, so let me ask you something. Um, I've had a lot of people tell me, you know, diet doctor was an amazing resource, but for my current patient base, I just, I just can't send them there anymore because satiety for calories become the face of it. And I don't think my patients will be doing well with this advice. Diet doctor still serves so many people. Do you think that having this so public and really parading it, maybe less so you than uh, quite honestly, Andreas, as the answer the future is harmful right now? Oh, wait. oh, do I think it's harmful? Because a lot of clinicians are saying they can't send people there anymore because they think that these scores could be harmful for their patients. Oh, oh, do you mean is financially damaging and bad for a diet doctor in general? No, no. I'm talking about for the people that go to diet doctor, the patients, the humans right now who they go on the website are looking for support and education and advice and direction. Well, it's, um, <laughs> those are the people I care about. Ironically, it's actually been a fairly positive response. So the interest in low carb and keto is really cratering globally. And a lot of people are just sort of slowly backing out of the room on keto. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed, but it hasn't been like super magic instant weight loss permanently for most people. So a lot of people are 
kind of slowly backing out of the room on extremely low carbon keto diets and sort of looking for other options. And a lot of people have really appreciated this because it just opens up a lot more directions that you could go in. It gives you a lot more levers to pull besides just one. And so uh, it's actually got a lot of positive response, but there are, there are definitely some like old school low carb people who do not like it at all. I will admit that it has not been well received in a certain segment of the low carbosphere. And yeah, I, I see that I am very aware of that. That is, that's is an issue. But that my, my, my question was right now, my impression, and again, now we're coming down to opinion bits, but if you want to know why I'm animated about this is because I knew a lot of people, including myself who would direct clients to diet doctor who simply can't because they think the information right now can be actively harmful to have a tool that's saying you can have this fast food meal. You can engineer your diet to have this and it's biologically equivalent to this other thing, or, you know, butter and olive oil are terrible. Maybe you should be having something more like a Coke. Again, maybe these are old scores. Maybe you put every single element in the satiety per calorie sphere into it, but this isn't what's facing patients. Um, so I, I think it's being posed. I mean, the claims that are being made about it are very strong. It explains every observable phenomenon in the diet space period. It's a very strong claim that can't be substantiated. The scores and the combinations are problematic. It's kind of tossing out the window a lot of endocrinology, ideas about fuel partitioning. I mean, you want to take examples of food like macadamia nuts. Do I think that they're the greatest weight loss tool of all time? Absolutely not. But just taking them as like an example food, do they have interesting properties that actually do affect the tidy per calorie? Not over the short term, but over the long term? Well, yeah. In fact, the uh, polyamidolic acid, the omega-7 in macadamia nuts, 2008 paper, it was the founding member of dietary lipokines, lipid hormones from the diet. And there are actually interventional trials showing if people introduce them as an intervention, 50 to 90 grams per day, there was weight loss over four weeks. It's not a controlled trial, but it definitely diverges from the model that is being posed because there is so much more to this than percent protein and fiber. But if somebody were to go to the SBC scoring system, you know, like macadamia nut score, I don't know if it still scores worse than milkshakes. I think that's been corrected, but you know what I mean? Like, this is not... I see both sides of this. I see both sides of this. I guess that's my role here is to be kind of trying to play both sides. Ted's side is yes, it's ruffling feathers feathers in the low carb world because it's going against this low carb model. And I and I'm yeah, I'm backing out of the room a little bit on this whole low carb thing as well. It's, and then, but then I see your side too, Nick. That if it could be giving people wrong information right now because yes, they could make a fast food meal. And it be a fifty, but that what what do you, what, what were you gonna say? I was gonna say this is again this isn't about not low carb. I've texted I t- tagged a lot of plant based people again the watermelon pizza comparison. Like it, it's very easy to virtue signal about oh this is more flexible low carb low carbers are extremist. Andreas did this in a post that then he bragged had like a third of a million views about the butter coffee. I don't actually know any serious or who I would consider serious low carb, you were saying, put a stick of butter in your coffee every morning and that's going to be great for you. There may be some who are, but let's call out those people and their individual claims for what they are rather than trying to make a blanket statement and then just kind of put this, you know, put the low carb extremists as an opponent. I don't think that's a fair thing to do in this scenario because this isn't about low carb versus SPC. This is about science versus pseudoscience. Let's talk about CIM. Yeah. Sure. CIM is carbohydrate insulin model. And Ted is no longer a fan of that. Maybe I'll let Ted go. Well, I think, uh, so basically, interestingly, um, the energy balance model basically took the little parts of CIM that were actually correct, like glycemic index, um, causing people to be hungry downstream, and just kind of absorbed that. And now 
carbohydrate intensive model is fully consistent with the energy balance model, which is, is this big overarching thing that anytime it sees, you know, something else that would influence energy balance, it just subsumes it and engulfs it like an amoeba. And then it's just part of the bigger picture. And honestly, I do think there is something to eating very high glycemic index foods and having a glycemic spike and then having some sort of hypoglycemia on the other side of that. I do think that's a real thing. I do think that can trigger some people to eat more downstream. And so, uh, but I think energy balance model just basically engulfed that and now it's just part of the bigger picture. And I think honestly, satiety per calorie is doing the exact same thing with low carb. It's like, oh yeah, eating uh, higher fiber and lower refined glycemic carbs. Sure, yeah, that's excellent advice. It's very helpful. That's gonna be part of the model. Um, Eating lower glycemic index food. That's going to be part of it, you know. So I think um, I think I like the energy balance model just because it it basically acknowledges everything, including low fat diets, which are every bit as effective as low carb is, especially in the long term. And and that's kind of how I see satiety per calorie and low carb. It's just like a subset now. Basically, it's fully consistent with the bigger picture, but kind of limited by itself. And that's my thought on carbohydrate insulin model. I want to respond, but I just want to ask one more question. Um, I did watch your, you had a clip on Diet Doctor in which you kind of explained some issues of the, the carbohydrate insulin model in your perspective. Um, and you were talking about internal starvation state, but the way you just described it, it sounded like you were on board with the internal starvation state concept. Do you want to elaborate on that before I respond? Uh, wait, say, say that again. The in, so one um, pillar or... Um, aspect of the, the carbohydrate insulin model is said that there's a postprandial energy deficit in the blood, that internal starvation state. It sounded like you were supporting that concept based on what you just said. Oh, oh right. Supporting that concept. Oh, I understand your question. Okay. Yeah. So the way it works is basically if you look at any kind of mixed meal scenario where you're eating protein or fat or fiber or carbs, whatever, a mixed meal, um, overweight people and insulin resistant people basically have higher fuel levels in the blood pretty much the entire time before, during, and after. It's very hard to capture uh, this sort of low point of internal starvation. Um, it, it's almost mythical. And uh, I do think that if you're eating just a refined high glycemic carb by itself, you can capture this postprandial dip that is visible in, in a lot of people. And so I, I basically think there, there is a nugget of truth and reality to that. And I also think that it's small enough that the carbohydrate model, carbohydrate insulin model by itself really just doesn't do a good job of explaining everything that we see out there. Um, but it explains a little bit. So you think the energy deficit in the late postprandial period in terms of like overall energy deficit is mythical? Is that the word you used? Say again? The overall energy deficit at the late postprandial period is mythical. There's no data to support it is what you're saying? Oh, I think there is in certain circumstances. But I think for your average garden variety obesity and your average person eating average meals, it's so non-existent that it's not really a factor. That's my position. All right. So first on that last bit, because I remember watching that interview, um, this is an area where I, I, I would like to do some teaching because I think it's one of those areas where it's really easy to get confused with the concepts. Um, so with respect to that internal starvation, let's say, aspect of the carbohydrate insulin model, at least the earlier models, what it said was, okay, one thing that might happen is with high glycemic load meal, your insulin goes up and then you know, it drives your glucose down and it also drives fatty acids into tissue. And so there's a relative decrease for that person postprandially in the sum of energy in the blood, say three to four hours after a meal, that's fatty acids, ketones, and um, glucose. At the three to four hour period, your brain picks this up, it lights up, and then you get hungry again. Does that explain all of obesity? No, of course not. But are there data to support that? Yes, absolutely. There's randomized control trials that support it. We can provide the link in the show notes, shimmy at all 2020. 
they show exactly that. And is it also true that people with obesity tend to have higher fatty acids and glucose? Yes. But you have to see where there's a distinction there. In the one case, we're actually talking about dynamic changes in an individual over the course of a meal time frame that drives them to overeat versus the end destination, which is obesity, which is the metabolic state at the end of the road, not the dynamic process to getting there. So you can say, yeah, people with obesity eating a mixed diet have higher free fatty acids, but that's a completely different thing from for a given individual, they have a relative energy dip in their blood um, over the course of time. So like, that's not falsifying the carbohydrate insulin model. That's just misunderstanding dynamic versus endpoint. One point. The other thing is I agree with you entirely that the energy balance model has the ability to just subsume everything. I like the analogy of amoeba. I thought that was cute. But I actually would say that it's not a scientific model per se. It's a description. It's just the laws of thermodynamics, which you can't break. It's tautological. So if we're talking about models that are scientific and make bold predictions that can be put to the test in randomized controlled trials, then the carbohydrate insulin model, it's incomplete. But it makes interesting predictions that on a population level have put to the test in randomized controlled trials and independent RCTs that were just reanalyzed. Like Dr. Sotomoto did the reanalysis of diet fits and showing that glycemic load was actually one of the major drivers in both the low carb and the low fat group for weight loss. It makes bold predictions that then can be tested and the model can be falsified. The energy balance model can't be falsified which means it's not a scientific model. It's just like, oh, we must have measured this wrong. It's all tautological and circular. It's a great description because it's just thermodynamics, but it's not a scientific model. So yeah, carbohydrate insulin model is not complete. And I think that's a, one of the areas where people get confused and try to criticize it because it's not attempting to be the end-all be-all. That's not what science does. When you do a scientific process, a scientific model, a scientific cascade, you're describing really only one part of the puzzle. I can't really think of many biological processes where we're like, this is everything. This model explains everything. Like, generally, it's not then a scientific model. In this case, energy balance model, it's just a description, it's just thermodynamics. So it can assume everything like a amoeba, but it's because it's not fossil viable, it's not science. I, I get what you're saying. I got to jump in here before Ted goes. I... My idea of satiety per calorie is it can explain a lot of things more than CIM or more than just low carb because you can look, why do high carb diets work, right? It's like there's certain diets that don't fit into the CIM model that can still work. And that's what Ted says. Like, yeah, plant-based diets can work for people. They can lose a lot of weight on these diets. I'm not saying they could be nutritionally complete. That's a different story, but they can lose a lot of weight. High carb diets what is it? The Kempner rice diet? You know, it's just pure starch rice. You can lose weight. So it's like the satiety per calorie thing. It kind of can explain, can explain all types of diets from any, any, that's my understanding of it. That's why I like satiety per calorie. It, it kind of mirrors nutrient density where it, it was, it includes protein and then the, the, the fiber and the water. It's like, that is nutrient dense because that doesn't even count towards the nutrient density kind of, right? It, things that have a lot of fiber and water can still be nutrient dense because if you, it, those, those things kind of disappear, uh, if that makes sense. So Ted, is that kind of what you mean by it can explain all diets? Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what I mean. <clears throat> the, there, there are so many things that you can't explain with carbohydrate m insulin model. I don't even know where to start. I mean, you can just pour oil on animals, food, and they will get fat. I mean, they just, you just can't explain that with the carbohydrate insulin model. Um, so, uh, but, I, and, I, and I, I hear what you're saying. The energy balance model is a tautology and it is just attempting to in, incorporate everything into it. And uh, honestly, I think a valid criticism of satiety per calories that it's doing the exact same thing. It's attempting to be a tautology that just basically... Uh, engulfs everything and if something doesn't match up we'll just uh incorporate that like the borg or something and it'll just become part of the system which is you know good and bad but i i do see what you're saying it is a tautology um and there are actually some parallels there 
I'm I'm not sure if I was clear enough on my prior point. The carbohydrate insulin model can't explain everything. I think that was that was the whole point of the my last diatribe. But it actually does explain more than people are giving it credit for. So we're expl- we're talking about the lower fat diets again. The diet fits trial was just reanalyzed, and glycemic load in the low fat group was one of the major explaining variables for why they lost weight. It was a lever, and that's what I'm saying. I'm saying it is one lever. And the idea that people can have high carb diets and not have obesity, even have high-ish glycemic load diets. Often these diets are actually low-ish glycemic load, even if they're higher carb, relatively speaking, but um, doesn't falsify the model because there are other variables that interact with it. And this is you know, how science works, the evolution of models. So another aspect of this reanalysis of diet fits was to say, okay, are there particular people based on the principles of this model that would benefit. And indeed, yeah, there's a beautiful three bar graph where we're looking at, okay, people who are hyperinsulin secretors, the model will predict they benefit the most from low carb. And did they? Yeah, they lost the most weight. If you had high basal insulin secretion, you were the one that benefited the most from uh, you know, carbohydrate restriction. By contrast, if somebody's a super athlete, young, healthy, you know, uh, insulin sensitive, then the lever of modifying your glycemic load is going to have a a relatively smaller impact. Um, But there is no model, no true model that will explain every phenomenon. It's a tidy per calorie as well. Let's talk about kids with on three to one or four to one ketogenic diets. That's 87 or 90% calories from fat. The satiety per calorie score is probably in the twenties, if not in the teens. They have real trouble gaining weight. They're generally much skinnier than the average American kid who are eating higher SPC foods. Um, there's no model that explains every group. Well, but, let, let Ted explain that one because I'm curious about that one. Uh, well, so there is sort of this, <clears throat> we recognize that there's this interesting plateau phenomenon where carb, when carbs and fats are together, you are eating more in general. And at the very extremes of low carbon and very extremes of low fat, you're actually going to eat a lot less. The, the same thing actually happens with extremes of low and high protein as well. And we do have that built into the model where you actually don't score as low as you would think on extremely low carb, higher fat diets. Um, should that be tweaked some more to explain away these kids on these high oil diets that are, um, you know, extremely high ketogenic ratios? Probably. Yeah. I'll admit there, there are tons of things like that, that we haven't subsumed (laughs) um, accurately enough. And that is definitely going to be a work in progress. So there are holes like that all over the place. Yes. And uh, high ketogenic ratio diets are, is probably a good example. So what's the mechanism do you think? Uh, Well, for me, I think it's sensory specific satiety. So you eat so much of one thing, it just gets really, really, really bland and monotonous and you're just going to not eat any more of it. Um, That's what I think is going on predominantly. I'm sure there's other factors as well. So So kind of like the potato diet. Sorry, kind of like the potato diet. Oh, and I I was going to say the other thing is uh, ketones themselves are Uh, provide a lot of satiety. So there's this ketone factor that's real as well that we don't exactly know how to quantify objectively. And I'm sure that would be a good argument against trying to score something like that, because that's another thing that we just don't know exactly what that would do. So to broaden that point, though, couldn't you say that metabolic context is incredibly important in how foods score in terms of satiety? And if that's the case, how can you possibly create a scoring system that would be generalizable? I think it might be important for a deep ketosis. Yeah, definitely. Um, And it might be totally impossible to ever really fully capture that. So there might be extremes. I I do think it's possible to break any scoring system and break any diet. Uh, If you told me, okay, just design the worst low carb diet in the world, it would be no problem. I could break any diet, just like you could break any scoring system. Um, but is it still, does it still add value? Um, is it still useful for the average person eating average foods? Um, if, if anyone knows of a better overarching heuristic that explains more than satiety per calorie, please tell me what it is because I would love to see it. Again, 
we're beyond heuristics. We're creating a precise scoring system. I'm all for principles of education. This isn't what what we're talking about here. So you're saying that satiety per calorie is the best heuristic for guiding eating decisions that you know of. No, I'm not saying that. But I oh, will okay. give you I will give you that as an abstraction, let's put it under the category of mindful eating, telling people to focus on nutrient density, foods that fill them up, high protein, let's say, um, you know, whole foods, yeah. whole foods. Yeah. If you want to say that's the satiety, if you want to put a satiety per calorie around that as the abstraction, I would say, I think it's good advice as an abstraction. That's where we started with. That's what I came to you with where I'm like, look, as an abstraction, I like this as a teaching tool. I don't like this as a scoring system. And I think it has fundamental flaws that aren't going to be reconciled. And that you're undermining what in the abstract is a good idea by trying to score it based on percent protein and fiber and whatever a hedonic factor is. Because that will inevitably create problematic systems that we went back to really like, you know, don't don't pass the, the do you through. think do you think it would be better if we just introduced the concept and then said, here are the different factors for these different foods? And um we don't really give you a numerical score. We just say this one's kind of good-ish and this one's bad-ish. And here's the exact protein percent, fiber, energy density, hedonic, that kind of thing. Yes, 100%. Because then also, it, well, first of all, it's more transparent. You're not really making objective claims on anything. You're just giving people data that then you can teach them how to process and you can add other variables to it, fun facts even. Imagine you had a nutrition profile for each food. Let's say it's the percent protein and the fiber. And then you're very clear, look, we're making up a hedonic factor, but we're going to give it something like a 1 to 10. So it's a little bit more rough. And as an additional point, each food gets a profile, and we might actually append some fun facts to it. So let's say the macadamia nuts. Whoa, there's this paper in 2008 showing actually the palmitoleic acid, and there are rat studies on this too, is in and of itself a satiety-promoting component. That would be cool. That would be a great education tool and where you could use satiety per calorie as a platform for educating and giving something that, if you want to call it more broad and palatable to the masses, could be. That's fine. I'm not, again, I'm not against satiety per calorie as a concept. It's the execution that I think is right now extremely problematic um, that I think needs to be done in a more rigorous manner. And I, and I, and I don't think, and I obviously have a biased sample pool from my Twitter followers, but I I really don't think I'm alone in that opinion. And what I will say is I, for one, and I think a lot of people don't hold grudges, like in terms of if you're like, I, I believe you're trying to do what you think is right. And if I were able to convince you and you were able to change to the approach that I just mentioned, it's like, great. Like, you know, I'm happy. I, I have nothing against you personally whatsoever. And I, I, like would only be too happy. It wouldn't be like an I told you so moment. And conversely, if this developed to a point where it was a lot more than it is currently, the there weren't absurd comparisons. You put it to an RCT and it was super valuable. I, I wouldn't like try to protect my ego and be like, oh, I already stick my you know flagpole in the sand. I'd be like, oh, cool. I think the best thing about science, the best parts of science, or when you can say, not that I was right, but that I was dead wrong and accept that and move forward. I don't think there should be shame in being wrong in science. So I know that there's a lot of uh, animation right here. For those listening, I, I really don't want them to take this as anything personal. I get animated about scientific debates. I harbor no ill will towards anyone here and think we're all trying to do the best. I think we're just passionate about what that might be. And in terms of, again, objective variables, useful heuristics. You know, I personally don't practice like PE ratio diet. However, you could say that is to some degree objective, transparent, a ratio that whether or not I practice it, people have definitely found helpful. So credit to you, Ted, on that. Um, satiety per calorie, I am very much yet to be convinced. 
Can I jump in real quick? Because just to explain the PD diet, Ted wrote a book on it. It's a protein to energy ratio. I think it's great. I think my view is that satiety per calorie is trying to go one step beyond that and, and do it a little better. Ted, what do you think? Yeah, that's exactly right. So basically, you know, I realized, oh, hey, protein percent is a massive big deal. This this explains a lot. And then I realized, oh, you know, it does not explain a ton of crap. It doesn't explain, you know, the Samane eating 9% protein and just being super lean. It doesn't explain all sorts of, I mean, it doesn't explain in Japan eating this, you know, very low fat, fairly, you know, average protein diet and just being very lean. It doesn't explain a ton of stuff. And so I, I keep attempting to explain more and more things that don't fit the model I've got. I started with things like low carb and paleo and plant-based and keto and carnivore. And I just saw so many black swans with all of those that I'm now I'm trying to have a bigger view that will basically incorporate things that I couldn't explain with other approaches. And study for calorie is the closest I've gotten so far. It's not perfect. It has major problems, but it's, it's uh, the best thing I've come up with to date. Let's put it that way. So yes, I am. It's basically refinement and admitting that the PE concept had a lot of, it didn't explain a whole lot of stuff. So this is basically just one step beyond that, just like you said. Yeah. And also I want to say, this is great. And thanks Nick for, you know, your last little rant there. Uh, I think this is awesome. And I think Ted's very open to this. It's almost like we just did a free uh, focus group. To, you Absolutely. Know, like this is very valuable. I really appreciate the feedback. It's awesome. And I think, I think it's great. I want things to, I want people to say, Hey, this sucks. This is terrible. This is wrong. Um, and every time something doesn't work, I, that, that's just, I, now I know it doesn't work. I can make something better. You know, it's just iteration. So this is all really good feedback. Are there, based on this discussions, I know you can't make a, a commitment, but going back to the diet doctor team, what out of this conversation did you hear most loudly that you think might be the basis for changing the way you're approaching satiety for calorie right now? If what, I, what I'm taking away from this is that the, the concept's good and teaching people what the individual components are that are highly objective is really good. And making those front and center, hey, this is a this is this has a really high protein or a really high fiber or a really low energy density. Um but what I'm taking away from this is that the actual numerical score is kind of sketchy and a little bit contrived and maybe a broader, you know, like good-ish or bad-ish would be seen as some people as being a lot more um, honest because, you know, having, a, you know, saying this food's a 58 and that one's a 59 is a little bit contrived when we don't really know, well, is protein percent more powerful than energy density? I think it's a totally valid criticism. I am completely walking away from this with that in mind. And I can see how people would have a problem with that. And like, honestly, we just don't have the data to really tease things like that out. So it is, we are putting a completely artificial layer on top of this by giving numbers like a 58 and a 59 for two different foods. I mean, that's just, we really don't know yeah. to any certain deal. Like, and we absolutely can't put error bars on those because like, if you thought our number was made up and wrong, an error bar would be even worse. So like, so what I'm taking away is the concept's awesome. The individual components are awesome. Educating people about these components is awesome. Uh, the exact numerical score, maybe it should just be like a big category. Like this is really good and really bad. And then just like somewhere in the middle or something like that. And, and to be honest, we had lots of different models that just had three buckets. It was like a Goldilocks system with too high, too low and somewhere in the middle ish. And we're still iterating on a lot of ways to display this. And we are just making this stuff up. So it is a, it's a work in progress for sure. That's great. And I want to go back to, I was saying there's, it's impossible to do a scoring system. You're never going to do a perfect scoring system. You're never going to do a perfect meal, like mixed food system. That's where the breakdown really occurs. And you're saying beef tacos and you know, your bad examples that you've shown on Twitter, Nick, are these mixed meals. You're never going to get those right. 
And I think it's this is what I've been going through because I've been trying to do my own system, like nutrient density score or whatever I, I've been trying to do for years. And it doesn't work because there's portion sizes and there's so many different things that factor in. It's like, yes, macadamia nuts can be fine in the context of a healthy diet, right? Because you're just, you, you can have a couple of them. Of course, it's great and it's good. But then, of course, the opposite extreme, if you're just chugging gallons of nuts, I don't know why he's gallons, but or chugging. If you're eating tons and tons of macadamia nuts, it's, it's not going to work. So the scoring system is never going to work for mixed meals. And I, I'll say one more thing is I like satiety per calorie because generally it's telling people to eat whole foods, to eat animal food, get animal complete protein, and that it can explain so many different types of diets. And that's what I've gone to for the film, for my content. It's like getting out of different camps. Let's zoom out and let's give people valuable data and heuristics to just make better decisions, which means eat whole foods, avoid processed energy, avoid refined carbs, avoid refined fats, and you're probably good. I agree with those principles. Yeah, so I guess we just can't. So we got to wrap it up here. I think people are still listening, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> I think we got some nerds that are they're sticking with us. I think this was super valuable uh, just for hopefully for both of you, for Diet Doctor, also just for the people listening who maybe don't care about the satiety per calorie score. I hope it's valuable just to hear all these nutrition concepts because I think we covered a lot of just general nutrition concepts that were valuable more than caring about Diet Doctor's system per se. So I hope uh, that was valuable for people. Anything else before we wrap up? Ted, do you have any closing Oh, I, and yeah, I just want to say Diet Doctor's always been an awesome resource. They're not getting rid of any of their stuff. It's still a good resource. Um, even people who uh, they're kind of splitting off like a, another whole separate little thing for this um, study per calorie. So none of their content is going away. I just want people to be clear on that. What do you mean they're breaking off like a rebrand? Uh, I think uh, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it. <laughs> But let's just say there might be like a separate direction for this thing that's not quite like there 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 might be a bifurcation between the low carb diet doctor and this approach. Um, yeah, I I guess my closing remarks would be, a, you know, I I could get behind satiety per calorie as a beneficial concept for people as an abstraction as something a foundation upon which to teach about certain principles. I've been animated because I think that the translation into the scoring system has been very problematic um, and a little bit opaque. So I, I'd love to see that change. And um, yeah, I hope people got things out of this conversation. When you post it, I'd love to see people respond with questions, what they thought was compelling, what questions they still have, because I, I suspect this will be an ongoing discussion and an evolution. So um, if there are points that were confusing, if we got too deep into the weeds, I would be very happy to clarify to anybody on any platform. But I uh, appreciate both of you taking the time, and especially Brian, for uh, being able to, to organize that. And finding a time for both of us to, to come together kind of impromptu was uh, probably pretty difficult. So thank you for your flexibility. It's great. Yeah, we put this together yesterday. It's Sunday night. You know, this isn't the best time to do this. We got it together. And I had a great time. And yes, let's post it. Well, I am going to post it on YouTube and Instagram and Twitter. And so yeah. I'll post a clip on Instagram and Twitter and we can have the comment section there for each platform. And then, of course, YouTube, you can have you get, people listening can comment on the YouTube video. And that would yeah. be super interesting to see what people have to say. Hopefully you guys can check out and engage in the comment sections on those platforms. And thanks, everyone. Yeah. yeah. Good stuff. Thanks for hour 50. <laughs> yeah.